Truth Seekers. Hey, I'm Pastor Ronald Kozar from Alpha Lines Den Ministries in Derry, Pennsylvania. And we are looking for truth seekers. Now, why would that be? Because the Bible says that you shall know the truth, and it's that truth that shall set you free. See, I believe the church has been just kind of ignorant regarding some things, and I believe we're really living in the last days. And that's what we're preaching and teaching. So if you are a truth seeker, I would like to invite you to one of our services. So I thank you for tuning in today. So come with me as we view today's message. Back to their spot. Run them back to their spot. Mm. As they 
and the lightning struck so they won't continue. Mm. And down they stuck their wings and folded. And down there was a throne of God with a round rainbow and that's the vision. That's the vision. <laughs> that is true and it is true and it is true. Amen. What chapter is that, baby? Is it you what? That's right, buddy. That's the first chapter. It is Ezekiel. You might, well, you, and remember, if you want to learn more about Ezekiel's vision, mm -hmm. find the Bible, go to Ezekiel 1, then you'll be able to see Ezekiel's vision. Amen. And God said to Ezekiel to know him. Like Isaiah, he said, Here I am, Lord, send me. Amen. Amen. Like, there was a far away time in the day of Ezekiel. And now it's time for 2018. And that's the preaching of Ezekiel's vision. Amen, buddy. Amen. Let's give a hand partnering up with this ministry uh, me and Deborah was up there for about a week up in New York and uh, David Hamer is the pastor up there and God has blessed him with this facility but we're looking at doing a 40 day revival up in New York and uh, this is just a phenomenal, phenomenal facility so he's given us discount rates and packages and if um if we go up there, we're definitely going, but I just want you guys to Not see Not for 40 it's... days. Well, I mean, no. I, you know, whatever God says, but I mean. <laughs>
just like we do with people here, that you could just love and trust and, and build God's kingdom with. Amen? Well, we've been doing a series. This is part three on what I call the Galatian Revelation. We're tying the book of Galatians to the book of Acts. I think those who have watched the first two parts have caught on to understand the only way that you'll ever understand your Bible, especially the New Testament, is to understand the book of Acts. We went in in-depth detail studies to show that Acts chapter 2 was the fourth feast of the Old Covenant that was fulfilled. It was the Feast of Pentecost. And when Jesus ascended into heaven, he told the disciples that they were to wait for the promise that the Father had made unto them that he was going to send the Holy Spirit back to the earth. So when that happened, that established the first New Testament church in Jerusalem. We know that there was a 12 and a half year period later in Acts chapter 10 that the second New Testament hub was established. And this hub was in Antioch and this church was primarily Gentile people. So from the resurrection of the Messiah in Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, that was not the birth of the church. The birth of the church took place in Acts 10 when God united Jew and Gentile together. And for the first time in your Bible, Gentiles heard the word of, the God, of God, believed, and received the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues to prove that they had received the Holy Spirit just as the Jews did. Now here's what's very important is that was 12 and a half years after the Messiah was on the earth. So then you have another 12 and a half year period that gets you to Acts chapter 15. You should read Acts chapter 15 a hundred times. If I've read it a thousand, you can read it a hundred. Acts chapter 15 is where you bring the two churches together. You can bring all the Jews together and all the Gentiles together. And they're trying to decide what to do with these believers. Amen? Amen. Rick, good to see you, buddy. Better late than never. You're just a couple minutes late. You're really not that late. But they took the Jewish believers in Christ. They took the Gentile believers in Christ and they brought them together. Because Pharisees, Jews who had believed, was telling the Gentile believers who had believed in Jesus that they had to circumcise their children and they had to observe the law of Moses. Now when they brought these two big groups, these two big hubs of the church together, they come up with four decrees for the Gentile believers to follow. Now listen, I've been studying this revelation for 22 years. I have just not fallen off the turnip truck. I know every single angle of this, every single argument about it, who they, why they say and what they say. And the only way that the New Testament fits totally together is you must understand that Peter was an apostle that was chosen to the circumcised believers. Peter was sent to preach to Jewish people, to circumcised believers, the circumcision, the old covenant, how they can receive the Messiah and still obey the old covenant if they choose. There is also an apostle, his name was Paul, who was set apart for the uncircumcised people, which were the Gentile people. Paul was there to preach to the uncircumcised people. We saw in Galatians 2 that these were two different Gospels. He said, God worked effectively in Galatians 2 about 5. God worked effectively for Peter in his apostleship or his gospel to the circumcised 
Just as he worked effectively for me, Paul said, in my gospel to the uncircumcised or the Gentiles. So there was two different gospels wrapped up within the same gospel. Jews will always be Jews. You are never going to change a Jew. Now if Jews, if Jews choose to, to be like a Gentile, they can do that. They do not have to observe the Old Testament laws and commandments. Same as the Gentiles. The Gentiles, the covenant is written to us as a whole. But if there are Gentiles that want to convert to Judaism and go back and try to fulfill that Old Testament law, knock yourself out. You can try to do that. But the New Testament clearly tells us that you cannot do that. You will never be able to fulfill the Old Testament law. If for no other reason we studied that the temple of God was destroyed in 70 AD. Once the temple is destroyed, that wipes everything out of the way. Jesus, when he was crucified, the veil inside the temple, the wall in the separating wall, the dividing wall was ripped from the top to the bottom. God tore that veil apart. So we're going to look at Galatians 5 today. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Galatians 5. If you haven't been here, please get one of our pamphlets, go to our YouTube channel, and have yourself a wonderful little Bible study. Amen? Marcia, it's good to see you back. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God is so faithful. Hallelujah. Listen, I understand this. Don't think for one second that I don't understand the way I preach and the way I teach. It's just not for everybody, even though it's for everybody. Do you understand that? We're way ahead of the curve. We're way ahead of the curve. But the church needs to hear the truth. In Hebrews 6, it says, Hebrews 6, 1 says, listen, when are you going to leave the elementary principles and the teachings about the Christ? When are you going to leave the things to talk about baptism, repentance from dead works, the laying on of hands? When are you going to get away from that baby infant stuff? There's a people that's coming on this earth. Listen, do you think those fires over in California are just happening by coincidence? They're not. Do you think all these floods and hurricanes, these places where my wife went and, and Witness that devastation? Do you think that's just happening by coincidence? Do you think this is exactly 70 years after Israel became a nation? This is a generation exactly to the year? Do you think that's a, just a, a coincidence that these things are happening? Do you think the things that are happening in Israel now, they're sending 500 missiles over there in one day? To bomb Israel? You think these things are just coincidence? There's no coincidence. Everything is ramping up right now. And I'm telling you, if you're not ready when it hits the fan, I'm telling you, you're going to suffer great loss. It's best to be prepared now and to know what is coming on the earth. Prepare your hearts and get ready. Amen? Amen? So if you're in Galatians 5, now, now, now listen to this. We looked at Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3 says this. Ephesians 3, 3. says, by referring to this, by referring to this, what we're studying, the, the, the um, similarities, the ties that go from Acts 15 into every single book of the New Testament, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which for generations has not been made known to the sons of man, but now it has been revealed. It's been revealed unto them. What is it? It's, a, it's Christ in you. It's the hope of glory. So by referring to this when you read, you can understand my insight 
into the mystery of Christ, which for generations has been hidden, but now it's been revealed. Galatians 5.1 says this, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled, entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Now, what do you think he's talking about? Most people talk about this and, and think he's talking about sin. When he says there that you're not supposed to be entangled again with a yoke of bondage, do you know what he's talking about? He's talking about the Jews who are preaching circumcision to the Gentile people saying, listen, do not subject yourself to that yoke of bondage again because you'll never be able to go back and receive it. You'll never be able to fulfill it. Remember last week we talked in Acts 16, 1. In Acts 16, 1 and 2, Paul took a man by the name of Timothy and he circumcised him. Why did he circumcise Timothy after Acts 15? Because of the Jews that were in that region. He wanted to minister unto the Jews because Timothy's mother was a Jew, so he had him circumcised. But we know later in his journeys, when we, when we looked at Galatians chapter 2, Paul also had a man by the name of Titus that went with him everywhere. We said Titus wasn't circumcised. He said he wasn't even led to be circumcised. He said we didn't even give in to them for one moment. Why? Because Paul knew what he was called out of. It's not that it's that's bad or the, or the, the, the um, gospel to the Gentiles is wrong or the gospel to the Jews is wrong. No, the Bible tells us, listen, you've got to rightly know how to divide the word of truth. If you divide something, you've got to know how to separate it one from the other. The problem with people today is, is all the Jews want to make Gentiles Jews. All the Gentiles want to make Jews Gentiles. And when they accept Jesus and they see Jesus in the New Testament, they still got Judaism within them. A Jew's like always a Jew. And as I've shared in every single feast, yes, we honor the feast. No, I don't celebrate all the holidays. That's just where I'm at in my walk. I don't want to beat anybody up on that. But I see the distinguishing differences of these things. When I look back at the Passover, there's no way I can celebrate coming out of Egypt. That doesn't mean anything to the Gentile people. The Passover is the Messiah. Jesus was the Passover lamb. When I look at Pentecost, when I look at the fulfillment of the Feast of Pentecost, I can't go out there in the field and get some, get some sheaves and, and a loaf of bread and wave them in the air and, and get all excited about the giving of the law, the Torah and, and Mount Sinai when Moses went up and ever, all the Israelites melted their gold down and turned their back on God and worshiped a calf. I can't get excited about that. But no, if I see Pentecost as the fulfillment of God sending, Jesus sending the Holy Spirit to the earth, it means something totally different to the Gentiles. But now if the Jews try to get us to see it as they do, it just don't fit unless you choose to want to do that. And vice versa. It's just two Gospels wrapped up within one. You can say it's one if you want, but there's two parts. It's just like if you talk about tires on your car. There's tires on your car, sure, but there's four of them. Now listen to this. Indeed, I, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, and he's talking about a yoke of bondage, you would think he's talking about sin. He said, I say to you that if you become circumcised, listen, Christ won't profit you anything. You'll just become a legalistic person trying to fulfill the law and you won't see Christ in it at all. This is why so many people fall away from the church. This is why they call people hypocrites and don't know who's what in the body of Christ anymore. He said, Christ will profit you nothing, and I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised, listen to this, that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. See, Paul understood this. There was no picking and choosing. 
You were rather all in or not. And that's where people mess up today. When you decide to follow that law, it was an all or nothing thing. You were a transgressor of the law or not. When you look at Jesus Christ, I said never minimize, never minimize the crucifixion of the Messiah. Why did God have to send his son anyway? Do you think Jesus had to come and die that brutal death just so we could go back and be like the Jews were? No way. There's a whole new covenant. The old has been abolished. It's been done away with. He said, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. He says, you have been separated from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of what? There is a hope of righteousness by faith. Now listen to this. In Genesis 17, we went back and looked at one of the first times that circumcision was mentioned when God told Abraham that he had to, that he had to circumcise his son. Then all the way up into Joshua chapter 5, so every single Jewish male child on the eighth day had to be circumcised as a religious rite of entry into that religion. Still today, we're going on about 4,000 years before the Messiah, and now we're at about 2,000 years after the Messiah. 6,000 years on God's timetable with only about one year left of which I believe that last year is the millennium when Jesus will come back and roll a rain on this earth. So no matter how you slice this up, we're getting close to the end. All arrows point that way. Now listen. He said, so when you look at this, the point I was making is this. 4,000 years before the Messiah, circumcision and the law was the way of the Jewish people. And even when the Messiah was on the earth, they were still circumcising their children. They were still telling them to observe the law. Even after the Messiah spent 40 days with them in his resurrected body, teaching them things concerning the kingdom, they were still observing the law and circumcision still they were still preaching in acts 2 3 4 5 6 7 until god called paul who was a persecutor of the church he was doing just what he was supposed to do according to the law listen could you put, wrap your mind around this before the temple was destroyed they were still killing people that didn't observe the sabbath the Sabbath says not only if you don't, if you defile the Sabbath, you're to be put to death, but anybody in your family that you know that doesn't observe the Sabbath, you're to put them to death. So as you observe the law, you've got to observe all the law. You've got to know what the law says. The problem with Gentiles today, they don't even know what the law says. But this circumcision was given. Do you know why the people were in the wilderness for 40 years? Because all the men of war who didn't circumcise their children on their way out of Egypt, and when they started to be in Israel, I mean in Egypt, they had to wait until all the men of war died off because God said, listen, you're not going to enter into the promised land because you didn't circumcise your children. Circumcision was a big deal to the Jews. Absolutely it was. But when Paul come out and he's saying these things, no wonder they hated him. No wonder the Jews thought he was nuts. He said, listen, circumcision doesn't even mean anything right now. He said, you've been separated from Christ. You've been severed from Christ. If you get your eyes on the law too much, it'll separate you from Christ. You'll never even see him in it anymore. You'll just become legalistic. Jesus will fall by the wayside. 
Now, through the Spirit, yes, we can fulfill the law. But we don't do that without Christ. He said, you have been separate from Christ. You attempt to be justified by the law. You have now fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, verse 6, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Now listen, he says, you were running well. I mean, you were doing good. He's talking to Gentiles that were being converted back to Judaism. That's what this book is all about. He said, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. And the little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you and in the Lord that you will have no other mind of you but he who troubles you shall bear his shame. Whoever he is. This goes back directly to Acts 15, 24, when they were saying, who is troubling you? When these Pharisees came in who had believed, and they were telling the New Testament Gentile believers that they had to be circumcised, and they had to observe the entire law of Moses. They said, who is troubling you? Who's sowing this seed in there about Christ? Because they were understanding that now Gentiles could believe Remember when he said this? He said, look, how did you receive the Spirit? Did you do it by the works of the law or by hearing in faith? He who does miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law? Or do you perform them by hearing and by faith? Mm -hmm. Verse 11. He said, and I, brethren, he said, I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I can wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. He's talking about circumcision. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love. But through love, serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. So he goes on, and this is what the Gentiles need to learn. Is Listen, once you understand... And it's not just being saved. People say that's just talking about being saved. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about everything. Sozo. Salvation. Complete. It's not just they try to limit it to just the one step. Okay, it's just talking about salvation. Because they see the truth and there's no other way you can deal with the truth unless you, jump, unless you bite it off right at the beginning. And say, when those Pharisees were coming, they were saying that that just meant salvation. That's not what it meant. It was through the whole gospel. Paul preached this not just about salvation at the beginning. He preached it on his way to Rome. He was willing to die for it. That there was a difference between Jew and Gentile when you're looking at the believer or complete so-so or complete salvation. So even though we're not saved by the law, even though we're not justified by the law, we still walk in the Spirit of God, and we can fulfill it. That's how Jews look at us in jealousy. Because there are Gentiles now that, listen, we know that thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You shouldn't bear false witness. You should honor your parents. I mean, those laws are written on our hearts now. And that's what's in every single book of the Bible when you go through this, these issues that we talked about in Galatians. It's in every single one of the books. And then by the end of the book, he tells you how you're to walk and how you're to live. He says, listen, I say then walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of your flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. 
And these are contrary one to the other, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, two of the four decrees, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, third of the four decrees, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which, as I told you before, just as I also tell you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you understand that? Those people that practice these things, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. There are people out there, there are hundreds of thousands of people in the world today that's never been born again. And they're out there and they're just being led by their flesh. The word tells you, listen, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Not everybody's going to thinks they're going. Nicodemus in Acts chapter 3, he was a religious man. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He come to Jesus and he said, hey, Rabbi, we know that you're a great teacher that was sent from God. And Jesus looked at him and he said, Nicodemus, a man must be born again. Nicodemus said, what, did, what does that mean? Am I to go back in my mother's womb and be born all over again? They didn't know what being born again meant. Jesus said, no, that which is born of the flesh, whoosh, that's just flesh. But those who are born of the spirit of God, they're spirit. There is a difference between the people on the earth. There are people that are walking around out there that are walking and talking, but there are dead men walking. That have never been born again, that have never confessed their sins, that have never asked Jesus into their heart to be Lord and Savior. That have never asked the Holy Spirit to come into their heart. Look at 613. Could you imagine Paul would say something like this? Galatians 6, verse 13. He said, For not even those who are circumcised, they don't keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. I mean, Paul was a Pharisee and a Pharisee. He said, according to the law, he was found blameless. But yet he called all that rubbish, or dung actually. He said all that's rubbish in, in understanding who Christ is and who our salvation, our justification. Everything is wrapped up in Christ and not the law. And it, it's such a dividing line because the only problem you get into is when you pull totally to one side and not the other and you judge and you measure. The Bible says that these people compare themselves by themselves, measure themselves to themselves. It says these people are without understanding. I mean, when Christ is totally set you free and you look at this and you see people that are that, are that way and they're drawn into that, you see just as the way Paul says, listen, there's no way. And then plus when Christ came, he said, listen, he said, he talked to the Pharisees, the people that were keeping the law. He said, listen, don't you know about idolatry? They said, yeah, I, we, we know about adultery. He said, even if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. So Jesus amped it up. Jesus turned it up, actually, on them. And when you look at the things that Jesus really said, he was turning it up to show them, listen, that's not how you're going to get salvation. That's not how you're